CS math side of things, uh, um, he is touching upon uh, the second of our talks today in astrophysics. Uh, here, machine learning uh, time domain uh, for time domain astrophysics, and uh, the interesting uh, part uh, about this is it's really going to answer one of the questions. Uh, it's an approach to answer one of the questions that Eric brought up in the previous talk which is what do you do when you have sparse, incomplete data from a survey like LSST um, when, when you're trying to sort through these uh, millions of objects every single night. So Josh, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, and thanks to the Simons Institute and to the Moore and the Sloan Foundations uh, for their uh, support um, in the past and, and currently. Uh, I think it's uh, worth saying at, at the outset that the fundamental reason why we actually do the work we do to um, innovate on the algorithmic side and computationally is to do novel science. In this case, it'll be in astrophysics. But what you're going to hear throughout the week um, is a uh, broad interest in using these tools and building new tools uh, to do some um, novel work in the physical domains. Um, we also use this. Uh, because of the fire hose that you just heard about in the previous talk, uh, just to be able to handle uh, that onslaught and be able to make the best uh, use of the data that's coming at us. And I think increasingly what we're seeing is that um, because this is a very powerful set of tools, i.e. machine learning um, in astronomy, it's also becoming a competitive advantage for the groups that know how to, how to use it. Let me start off um, with... Uh, you know, what is probably the most exciting discovery of the last decade, if not longer, um, in astrophysics, which brings together actually the physics community and the astrophysics community around uh, the so-called merging neutron star events. You're going to hear a lot about this um, from Alessandra and Monsi um, later today, so I don't want to harp on it, but use it really as a, as a launching off point, point of departure. Um, for saying that there are some very big prizes uh, in understanding uh, the, the universe and the connection of, say, the gravitational wave universe with the electromagnetic uh, universe. And uh, we're just starting to see this era uh, start up. Um, and so the, the discovery uh, last, uh, last summer and the announcements that you heard about um, just over the last couple of months uh, have really emphasized uh, to many of us the importance of being able to do real-time inference and discovery, um, not just because if you don't find it, you don't get to do good science afterwards, but because there's many other groups working on this. Um, and in fact, that's uh, perhaps best shown with this paper here, um, which has 3,677 authors. Uh, there are a lot of people involved um, in this work, all sort of taking different facets around uh, what is fundamentally just a single event. So you hear a lot more about that um, event and its importance and its implications later on. Um, but I think uh, this event really is a great uh, reason for us to recognize that um, we need to do discovery on images, as you heard about in the previous talk, and you heard about for those of you there, that were at the boot camp before. Um, on the left-hand side, you know, are these real or spurious images? That's an important question. And then we need to do inference. So if you look at uh, the graph on the right-hand side, um, this is what we call a light curve in astronomy parlance. It's basically brightness on the y-axis and time on the, on the x-axis. And the question is, is it worth, when you look at this, spending time on this object, not just with the instrument that's doing the discovery, uh, but with other follow-up facilities that are potentially more sensitive or can look at it uh, in a different wavelength or take a spectrum um, to understand perhaps the chemical composition of this, of this object. So that's the question that we um, ask. And if it wasn't clear from Eric's talk, it's probably worth saying that if you have sufficient sensitivity, every single thing in the sky changes. It changes its color, it changes its brightness, it changes its position on the sky. Um, if you look hard enough. And so while oftentimes we um, focus on the things that are most fantastic, the biggest explosions that just become so obvious, they're as bright as their whole host galaxy, um, there are lots more subtle objects that are only changing at the few percent level or less that um, have some very interesting um, uh, facets to them that um, many groups want to follow up. Um, what you see on the right-hand side is also a light curve that's pretty rich. Um, you see it's irregularly sampled. You can't really see the, the, the fact that some of these data points are noisy. But oftentimes, um, some of the most exciting uh, science comes out 
when you only have one or two data points on a new object as it's being born or as it's just starting to evolve. And so a really important question that we have to wind up asking, again, in the real-time context, is if we only have a few data points, uh, do we observe that object and continue to observe that object and keep burning uh, resources? Um, so the agenda uh, in my talk today uh, really geared for non-astronomers to get someone up to speed in the state of machine learning uh, in the time domain astronomy world um, is uh, to introduce to you the different ways in which we uh, uh, view the time domain um, and real time type sort of inference uh, with the lens not just as astronomers but people who are applying um, and potentially even innovating on some of the tools uh, to, to get uh, better science out. Um, and I hope at the end uh, to present uh, some interesting challenges and maybe even some right places to start um, for the non-astronomers in the room uh, from a collaborative perspective. Um, so I'll start with just some of the uh, constraints and some of the things that we think about when we're building some of these um, computational systems and working on some of our algorithms. Um, I'll uh, talk about uh, discovery, and this has been uh, discussed both in the previous talk and was also done in the boot camp, so I'll go over that part pretty quickly um, and focus a lot on inference. So the real-time part of the inference, so what is this object? I only have a few data points. What do I do next? And then the retrospective, not just looking at a single object, but looking at large catalogs of objects um, in the time domain to try to figure out how I get good science out. And then I'll end with uh, some of those um, challenges and open questions. Just to level set, um, what I'll present here, something that doesn't look at all like the scientific method, but is actually the way in which astronomers work, um, is you do lots of planning uh, and acquisition of data. Um, so what you heard about in LSST, what, you, what you'll see about uh, ZTF, is trying to figure out the ways in which you wind up um, observing the sky. So this is what's often called uh, the cadence. So how often do you repeat uh, a certain observation of the same part of the sky? And there's obviously a trade-off. If you don't go back to the same part of the sky, then you're going to miss objects that are changing rapidly. But it means then you have the opportunity to survey a larger part of the sky. Um, so there is always uh, some biases um, in a positive way of what type of science people are trying to get at uh, from that perspective. Um, it's you know, allocating telescope resources, it's deciding how to move the data around, et cetera. The next part, uh, which I won't spend much time on either as well, is in the cataloging characterization. You heard about from Eric's talk um, how LSST is going to be uh, basically cataloging potentially interesting places on the sky um, and maybe even telling you a little bit about the properties of those objects on the sky. So how do you extract from an image of the sky, how do you extract metadata, metadata like the brightness? Um, and that's a non-trivial exercise and it needs to be done right and well, uh, certainly at scale. Um, associating that data with other, uh, other catalogs is important. And again, storage and retrieval of that and making that efficient and useful for communities is quite important. Um, instead, what I'll, what I'll focus on is really the next part is in the discovery, which is the question, uh, is this source in my catalog real or not? Um, and you know, what is, is, is the source even potentially interesting for me to spend time on? Um, and uh, you know, what's the appropriate science that I could potentially get out of this if I decided to keep going and start asking more questions of, of this data? And I make the distinction, by the way, between cataloging and discovery, um, because if you put something in your database, it doesn't mean you recognize that it's interesting. And for me, sort of the best exemplar of this um, comes from uh, a catalog uh, from about 400 years ago from Galileo, um, who was observing and discovering the Galilean moons. Um, and you can see uh, basically the actual uh, photograph of, uh, of part of that journal. Um, there's Jupiter there. There's um, three of the Galilean moons. And uh, we now know on that day that Jupiter was actually at the position that's um, listed as a fixed star. Um, and about two weeks later, Galileo came back and noticed that that fixed star had kind of moved but didn't really recognize that that was actually another planet. So it was about 150 years later that Jupiter, sorry, Neptune was actually discovered. Um, so I, I find this fascinating and potentially sort of the best sort of well-known example uh, in, in science of cataloging something really important, um, but not recognizing its importance. Right, so I, I try to make that um, distinction. I, I argue that if Galileo had found Neptune, he would have been very famous. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, we've got some laughter, which is good. Um, so what comes after discovery um, is inference. So I now know this object is interesting. I now know it's real. Um, what is this source? Uh, is this like something we've seen before? Um, is it not? Uh, if we're right about the classification, what is it going to look like the next time I observe? Um, and then the last part of that is what's the next action. This is the federation that came up in some of the discussion uh, after the last talk. Um, is this source important enough to spend more resources on it? And what is it that I actually want to do with it? Uh, and more importantly, perhaps, given the sociology of uh, the astronomy community, is can I convince my friends and collaborators and enemies to actually stop observing what they're looking at because my object is more important than your object. And we still very much focus from a real-time perspective on individual objects. Um, and I'll try to emphasize for you in just a little bit why, why, that, why that's so. Uh, and then the last part of that, of course, is if you then have that uh, hypothesis about what, what you should be doing next, um, you go and you plan and you get more data. All right? And so this cycle sort of continues on and on. Um, all right, so let me uh, sort of give you four different facets of the things that we're trying to optimize over because in the end, if we're talking about machine learning, we're talking about some sort of optimization. And unfortunately, this is not uh, you know, a loss function that I can trivially write down and then I just throw whatever mechanics I have at it to get, to get the right answer. Some of this stuff is a little bit softer, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about the ways that we, we think about this and are motivated by it. Number one is something I think you all know. Um, which is that experts don't scale. Astronomers haven't quite figured that out yet. So this picture from the 1890s of a bunch of um, so-called computers looking at lots of images when astronomy had a big data problem, lots of images coming off of telescopes, was hire and train people to just look at data. Right? This is what I call the just hire more grad students uh, syndrome, um, which is what many of us have been told for years, even in the time domain, that if you have more data, you just need to get more grad students to look at that data. That obviously doesn't scale, um, both in sort of the sheer numbers, but um, if we're also interested in some of these real-time applications where an image is taken and then 60 seconds later you need to take a, another action based on those images, people aren't that fast. And from a, another perspective, which is probably even the most damning, is that people are pretty subjective, right? And so if we want to do this in an objective way, doesn't mean that there won't be biases, you want to be able to do what it is that these people are doing on the right programmatically and do it systematically, um, at least where you can codify and you can version what it is that they're doing. Another facet, um, which I think has been sort of uh, danced around a little bit uh, when we talk about the LSST fire hose, is that we're now entering this age of what I'll call cheap discovery, where we're going to be getting literally 10 million transient alerts per night from LSST and a sort of maybe an order of magnitude less um, from ZTF uh, starting next week. Um, but we have a very, very expensive follow up. To get sort of the best and most novel science out of the, the, the changing sky, um, we have to use these facilities um, like the Hubble Space Telescope, like the James Webb Space Telescope. These are all sort of billion dollar plus level facilities. Um, and those resources, as you can imagine, are very precious and they're massively oversubscribed. Everybody wants to be using these facilities and it's extremely expensive um, uh, for them to do that. So there's an opportunity cost uh, because when you do your science, it means somebody else isn't doing their science. And that's kind of interesting from a systemic uh, perspective. Um, there's also the people opportunity cost as well. It, it actually costs energy and people um, to actually spend time uh, getting these observations um, prepared. Um, and then there's these sort of interesting questions around that, is the <laughs> kind of false positives, right? If I'm trying to do extremely novel science, how often should I be using one of these billion dollar facilities and just observing a pl pl place in the sky where there actually good science doesn't come out? Um, and oftentimes you wind up being more conservative and requiring a guarantee scientific payout before you actually do any speculative work on these, uh, on these big facilities. But Another facet, sorry, what's that? Discovery is getting expensive, right, with LSST? Uh, you could, well, discovery per, or dollars per discovery um, would be an interesting number to look at. Um, I, I'd argue that it's actually getting cheaper. Um, if, LS, if each one of those is equally interesting, 
Um, you could argue, and again, because LSST wasn't designed to do time domain, it was designed to do other um, science in the static sky, um, I'd argue that's a, a, a very, very cheap use of resources to, to sort of piggyback off of the static sky science. Um, and then there's the kind of Rumsfeldian challenge, which is uh, trying to optimize over the known knowns. So there's some bread and butter science that you could get out of doing um, time domain. The unknown unknowns, um, and then stuff in the middle, like you know things that you have theoretical models for, but you haven't yet seen, um, like the known unknowns. And what's interesting is that this plot is, I don't know, 10 years old or so. Um, the curve that you see for the neutron star neutron star mergers is approximately correct. Um, just from the theoretical uh, perspective of what we expected to see um, following a neutron star neutron star merger. Now I'd call this sort of more of a known known, um, but before I used to herald that one uh, as a you know, known unknown. Uh, but there's stuff that are unknown unknowns, and you know, by definition, I can't put them on this plot. Um, so you see the time scales over which uh, big explosive events wind up um, proceeding. Um, there's some really other interesting things that wind up happening even on shorter time scales than are, than are shown here, um, and I'll, I'll emphasize those a little bit later on. Um, so another aspect of this Rumsfeldian challenge is the small number of labels. Right, so in a, in a huge amount of the machine learning uh, literature, there is this sort of implicit assumption that I have lots and lots of data, from at least from a supervised perspective, to be able to build these models, right? And so if you want to build a good image classifier, just get more images um, and get a whole bunch of people to label them, like at the Flickr level or um, do it implicitly uh, through Google searches and things like that. Um, in astronomy, we don't have that many labels. So for things that we're really interested in, we only have one exemplar of a real object that is a neutron star neutron star merger. One. Uh, we've got theoretical models of a whole bunch of those um, with different inputs. Um, but uh, for some of these, we really only have dozens, or maybe hundreds at best, or maybe thousands as we're entering into this LSST era. So we're really, you know, even though it's a big data sort of uh, fire hose, from a labeling perspective, it's still very much a small data problem. Um, and the last is that, you know, it's all well and good to uh, have some plots that show how you have a, you know, sort of better false positive versus false negative curve than somebody else. In retrospect, these systems that involve machine learning that are going to be put into place um, for astronomy have to be done with robust systems that actually work in real time. And um, oftentimes, one of the biggest challenges we have is not on the algorithmic side. It's not on um, you know, uh, being able to produce those plots in retrospect. It's being able to stand up uh, robust systems that work at scale that can ingest this fire hose and produce results that people can wind up accepting and using um, and then moving on into that um, value chain of, of inference. And so for those that um, haven't read this yet, this is one of my um, favorite papers in machine learning. It has no equations in it. Um, it just sort of highlights um, all the different bugaboos of um, what it means to build a, uh, a real robust functioning system that involves um, machine learning and how different that is even from just best software engineering practices. Um, so forget about the fact that astronomers are not trained as software engineers. We're certainly not trained in general um, as being able to build and stand up and maintain and innovate um, these very large scale systems. So that's sort of some of the constraints and some of the concerns that we have um, as we start thinking about bringing machine learning uh, into, into our world. Um, I want to now touch a little bit now on discovery. Um, so that, that facet of I've got something in my database, is this interesting, is it real, and what should I do next with it? Uh, you've already seen uh, real bogus uh, mentioned in the previous talk. Um, you see kind of the uh, bad subtractions on the top as we're trying to find new objects and the real um, good subtractions on the bottom. Um, it's a little bit like kind of Anna, Anna Karenina, right, where all the bogus detections are all different than each other and all the real ones are all um, similar to each other. Um, but unfortunately, uh, state of the art, puts us at about 1,000 to 1, or maybe we're getting down to a few hundred to 1 of this, of this needle in the haystack. That is, for every real object in a real image that we wind up taking of the sky, there are hundreds of uh, bogus detections. So we have to find um, these real ones uh, in, in the face of quite a large number of uh, bogus detections. 
And what's nice is that if we can uh, build a real-time framework to identify what's real and what's not, um, we get some really nice things out of that, right? It will be fast uh, because it's just uh, algorithmic implementation. Um, embarrassingly parallel because every single object we can ask that question. Uh, transparent in the sense that we can know um, why we got the answer we got. So if you're doing it in a random forest context, you can literally follow down the different trees and figure out why you got that answer. It's deterministic, so given the same data, you get the same answer, unlike with people. Um, and it's versionable, so I can keep on upgrading it. And if I need to go back and reproduce what I had before, um, I at least have a fighting chance at that. Um, what we found uh, in some of the early work on building a real bogus detector for real systems um, was that it was a very hard problem. Uh, based on features that we derived out of the images and the subtraction images, we got of order um, 75 of those. Um, first of all, that's a bit of a computational challenge because uh, some of those features are expensive um, to construct. Um, but then we also wound up realizing that there are only really a few algorithms that actually did well on the same input feature space. Um, and in particular, we, we found that Random Forest was doing extremely well relative to all the others given the same feature set. Um, and so uh, we wound up implementing this um, and sticking this into a real pipeline um, uh, that was run up at LBL as part, of, uh, as part of PTF. And what happened is every time a new transient or a new object was cataloged, it would wind up getting scored in a real bogus sense from 0 to 1. And then depending upon where you make your cut of what you call real and what you call not real, um, you wind up uh, basically pushing this into uh, downstream systems uh, to be followed up and potentially even looked at um, uh, by people. Um, one of the things that, for those that were at the boot camp saw, um, and the astronomers already know about this, is this um, great discovery uh, that was done by Peter, uh, which I'll call ML assisted in the sense that uh, a real bogus um, classifier was applied to uh, this incoming data stream um, on new images that were coming off of uh, PTF. And about 11 hours after um, explosion, uh, PTF wound up uh, observing and cataloging. And then Peter wound up noting that one of the highest ranked real bogus objects um, from, the, uh, from the catalog was actually a very young supernova um, that turned out to be the nearest type 1a supernova in more than three decades. So only a few people you know, in the history of mankind have observed uh, supernovae this close by and this early and have been the discoverer. So I was, I was very happy to see that Peter changed his business card um, just so everyone uh, <laughs> knew how important that was. Um, <laughs> But uh, the problem is covering a student to be determined. Yeah, exactly. There's a student <laughs> under that fingernail there. Um, but what's, what's more important, and, and this supernova, by the way, would wind up rising uh, in brightness to the point where if you had binoculars, you could have, have observed it with, a, with basically through those binoculars, which is just absolutely stunning. So it was eventually found and could have been seen by um, astronomers worldwide. But because it was found so early, uh, we were able to do, as a community, a lot of really interesting science that we hadn't been able to do um, in the decades uh, before that, um, get spectra, get more observations of it. Um, and a paper that I uh, worked on with uh, Peter and a few others um, in the room uh, was basically ruling out uh, possible progenitors, the things that make uh, those supernovae. So everything in green and all the other colors were excluded um, because of the lack of uh, detections of certain uh, uh, characteristic signatures that we could have seen. And that left behind essentially only compact objects as the only viable candidates. Um, so don't, it doesn't matter that you know all the different um, plots, uh, what they all mean up here. Uh, just to point out, though, that because we were able to get on so early to this object and recognize its importance, we are able to do some novel science with that. So this idea of, of building real bogus has really um, kind of uh, flourished. And as Danny talked about, and this is one of, um, one of his slides from uh, his boot camp um, uh, discussion, is that this was used in the dark energy uh, camera survey, um, uh, particularly around finding uh, supernovae. Um, and so there they wind up building another real bogus detector. And um, they set a different threshold uh, between 0 and 1. And depending upon whether you're above or below that threshold, um, you wound up getting what is essentially kind of world-class um, uh, false positive, false negative rates. 
So getting down to MDR means missed detection rate, meaning that if you set your threshold criteria at, uh, at, at 0.5, um, around 4% of the new candidates that you wind up having in your catalog, you wind up not identifying as real. Um, but that means that your false positive rate is also extremely low, right? So you see where this trade-off is. Only about 2% you would say are real um, when they're actually not. Now the nice thing is if you keep on coming back to different, the same part of the sky, you wind up um, seeing the evolution of this real bogus score. And objects that are getting brighter in, in the sky generally will wind up getting a more favorable real bogus score over time. Um, so uh, this has now become uh, cottage industry and essentially every um, time domain survey that is uh, looking at images is has their own sort of flavor and their own approach um, and their own training data uh, for being able to identify and do discovery effectively in real time. So I, I'd say um, while there's probably still a little bit uh, of blood to squeeze out of the stone, um, if you look at this plot on the right hand side, uh, I, we can't get much better than this. Um, so maybe we get down a sort of factor of two or something like that in misdetection rate. Um, but uh, just to, to emphasize that this isn't just a uh, theoretical exercise um, on existing old data. These are being put into practice in real-time systems. Let me talk a little bit more about real-time inference as part of the, uh, and by the way, um, you know, please stop me if you have any uh, questions. Um, I'm happy to take them in real time. Yeah, yeah but so I was only joking. I am not taking any questions. <laughs> <laughs> so when you, so if it's a 2% uh, false positive rate, that still means like a 30% of the things that you're saying are real are in fact bogus? Because there are 100 times more bogus elements? Yeah, yeah, so if you do the, if you do the math, you're, you're actually saying that, and this is why you need to pull this number way, way down. Oftentimes, most people won't start observing and doing follow-up until there's multiple real detections in the same place of the sky. Um, or you're willing to, you know, if it's a nearby galaxy, um, ask a, sort of from a query perspective, um, is there something which is really new, which has just only got one detection, it looks like it's real, um, and uh, it's near one of those galaxies. In that case, you might be willing to put your neck out and actually start observing with other telescope facilities. The other thing you can do is that's just where the threshold is, and in principle, that's where the gray area is. If you want to be extremely confident in what you actually call is real, even with a single detection, you can just require your, your tau, in this case, to be very, very close to one. And so that's really kind of a measure of probability. Um, I, w I don't know how well calibrated that is for the DS survey of it, if it's at, f if it's at 0.5, whether it's really 50-50 real or not. Um, but uh, that's one way you can gain confidence and cut down the number of sort of follow-ups after that. Yeah. Is, is this, this is just photometrically based, or? Uh, this is just photometrically based as in, oh, sorry, what, what do you mean by that? There's no spectra. There's no spectra. No spectra yet, right. Correct. So this would be the launching off point to get spectra. So these are just based on the images and the preceding images for that part of the sky. Okay, yeah. Quick background. Spectroscopic information is expensive. That's, thank you for saying that. Spectroscopic information is extremely expensive. Um, typically that's only done on one object or only a handful of objects. Um, and you typically need large telescopes to do it and it has to be a pointed observation. Yes. I guess it's a more general question, so we can take it at the end. It's too much of general, general thing. I'm curious about, and in general, for astrophysics, what is the real cost of discarding the data? So if you are sticking some, I'm not saying black box, but something that you might not completely understand what the, uh, how the process works, and you throw out some real signals, how, how bad is this for, for discovery? Um, no, it's a fine thing to talk about now. It's a great question. So for those that didn't hear, it's, um, how bad is it to throw out you know, real signals that you just misclassified eff effectively? Um, unlike in particle physics where we, you know, we really can't save all the data as it's coming off of, a, of an accelerator and you have to make choices essentially in very real time about whether I save this event or I don't save this event. Astronomers at least are in a mode, even in the LSST era, where every photon is sacred, 
and we save everything. Now, it goes into a database, but um, and in principle, if that part of the sky becomes interesting eventually, we then have a, a, essentially a fossil record from our databases of what we had said before and what was there before. So um, we're not really throwing that out. There are interesting questions about accessibility to those databases and whether that's really kind of a dev null, um, you know, in all practical terms, um, or whether that's something that people can actually mine. I would generally argue that most people are not mining previous um, uh, surveys and their data uh, effectively. Um, but when you do, you often get you know, lots and lots of prizes about what was happening in that part of the sky before you observed there. So when you, when you use something like this, you're not discarding data? You're not discarding them, but you're, again, you're, it's sort of a, a decision process of I've got this huge fire hose. I've got to somehow make that into a, like a little nice stream of things that I can handle. And I'm not going to throw out all the water that's in the fire hose that I'm not dealing with. I'm only going to deal with the things that I really like. But because um, we're often interested in the changing sky on rapid timescales, and the most interesting observations that we can take are ones that come um, uh, you know, immediately after discovery, it doesn't help me much if I go back into my catalog a year later and say, oh, there was a really cool thing that was happening. Too bad, because most of the objects, if you go back to my light curve plot of the known unknowns and the known knowns, most of those things eventually disappear. Um, and so if you miss it, it's pretty much gone. So from a real-time inference perspective, um, uh, just quickly, what we were able to do is put a very rudimentary uh, classifier in the next step, which is this is an interesting source. What is that potential source? Um, we had sort of uh, you know, three high-level types. Is it a variable star of some sort? Is it a transient, i.e. something that's um, changing explosively? Or is it a, a rock in our own, um, in our own uh, solar system, um, i.e. An, an asteroid or so? Um, and then there's subclasses um, beyond that. Uh, we didn't do a great job of, uh, and this is a, a, a confusion matrix um, for those that know about that. Basically, you'd like to see all your power up to one on the diagonal and all the off-diagonal power is uh, misclassifications. We didn't do a great job with this, but we did show that you could use um, external databases uh, effectively in real time to get some notion of what um, this object was, um, which gave a little bit of indication for those working on that survey. Um, this, would be worth, uh, this would be worth looking at. And again, a big part of what we try to do is not just do this on paper, but do it in practice. And so we got to the point where uh, this classifier was acting as a person and having conversations in the same effective chat room against um, uh, with other people. Um, and this is what we call the PTF robot. And in this case, it was saying, I think this is a supernova or a nova or some explosive transient of some sort. Um, and then uh, it turned out this turned out to be a very interesting object, which led to uh, a paper in Nature, where actually we had missed it, but there was some burbling before this actual explosive event, uh, which was a really important uh, find uh, uh, for supernovae to be able to see some pre-supernova um, activity. So again, we got to the point, I wouldn't say where we had uh, great results or it was um, very accurate, but we at least spent some time in trying to make sure that this got into production. Uh, this isn't just in the optical domain. Uh, we've done similar things of being able to do real-time inference uh, in, uh, in the gamma ray sky on objects that I've spent a bunch of time on, these things called uh, gamma ray bursts. Um, and these are basically short-lived blasts of high-energy light, gamma rays and x-rays that come from a random place in the sky. Um, what you see on the left-hand side is a depiction of the static gamma ray sky. Essentially, this is the entire sky if you looked out with gamma ray eyes. And then you see a burst that lasts um, for five seconds or so, and it briefly swamps the entire universe in, uh, in gamma rays. Um, so these are very, very bright events, uh, difficult to localize on the sky, but they don't just produce gamma rays, they also wind up producing um, optical light after that. Um, and these are the brightest optical um, sources in the universe, much brighter than uh, um, quasars, um, much brighter than pretty much any type of supernova you could ever imagine. You see the um, relative brightness on the y-axis here in uh, log scale in power. So some of the brightest um, uh, gamma ray bursts, afterglows as they're called, uh, are, are just 
you know, swamp everything else as well in the optical sky. And what's great about that is we can see these events to the edge of the observable universe. And if we can recognize that we have an object that can be observed at the edge of the observable universe with um, large uh, telescopes, we can get uh, spectra, for instance, of these afterglow. And they act as sort of lighthouses. And we can learn a lot about the, the very early universe um, using those events as probes, if only we observe them in the few, first few hours after they've happened. Mechanism? Uh, so the mechanism, uh, the progenitors that lead to these things, the ones that are very bright are basically uh, very large, massive stars that wind up collapsing probably to a black hole. Think of these as sort of beyond supernovae, which wind up collapsing to other types of objects. Um, and then the actual physics of what produces this light um, are basically relativistic shocks that are emitted um, uh, that are moving you know, very, very close to the speed of light and have a tremendous amount of energy. And that energy, uh, the kinetic energy, is released as these, as these shocks wind up happening. Um, so what, what you'd like to do is be able to take the information not from uh, ground-based uh, observatories, which have a hard time observing gamma ray light, um, but from the satellites that wind up discovering these things and inferring whether uh, the objects you have um, are at high redshift, so very, very high distance, very far away objects. And this is also a hard problem. Um, and what we uh, wind up looking at is whether we could take um, and you can probably see right here, there's only a few objects in red that are these very high redshift objects that we'd like to follow up with our big facilities. Um, and the ones in black are the ones whose redshifts we know are not very high. And the ones in gray are ones we don't know, we don't know the answers to. Um, and there's just not that many of those. So the question is, could we take the immediately available data and make a prediction of whether something is high redsh redshift or not? And the answer is really no. Um, as you can probably see, uh, it might be a little bit difficult, uh, there's almost no way to pick the red points out of the other points. Um, but now we have multiple features that we can try to use to try to uh, improve it. And what we did is we said, well, if we can't say yes or no, this thing is definitely in a high redshift or not, can we arrange a new object to say, um, if I have an X amount of observing time to follow up, um, is it worth doing or not? Which is a slightly, uh, a slightly harder question to ask. But we wound up finding that um, if we only follow up 20% uh, of the ones that we are sort of rank order and say um, are the highest redshift, then 60% of those will wind up being at high redshift. So this is a you know, big impurity, uh, big uh, precision recall problem. But um, the area under that curve uh, relative to random is actually non-zero. So, um, this is actually a very useful tool that we're able to um, build and deploy. Um, and uh, we, we did it with only basically 600 events. And talk about small numbers of labels, we only had 17 objects that we could train on. Um, so getting uh, you know, guarantees, or at least trying to convince ourselves that we weren't overfitting on the data was where we spent most of our, our time. OK, let me um, transition now to large scale aggregate um, inference, not on individual objects necessarily in real time, um, but in the time domain over large catalogs of Justin, sources. Yeah. Was that validated with real follow-up or with synthetic retrospective? We, for a year or two, were publishing whether we think something is high redshift or not. Um, you know, we had a hard time actually just determining whether we were right with this calibrated curve. Um, but certainly there were a few that we thought were high redshift, which weren't, and it was the other way around. But um, this wasn't actually a w very well used tool, to be honest, uh, in the community. And we wound up shutting it down. So this is an example of something that worked really well on paper, but potentially not very well in practice. What, may I ask the same question on uh, what, uh, what data is going into the So this is data that's just available, um, for those that know about it, from the SWIFT satellite. So uh, when one of these satellites winds up discovering a gamma ray burst, they send down a whole telemetry of stuff like where it is in the sky, how bright it was, how long it lasted, and some other information about the rudimentary spectrum. Um, so I think there are eight or 10 features that went into this. No host properties. No, no, no. This is literally just the first packet that comes down from SWIFT, what can we say about it, without knowing anything about what's d detected in UVOT or, or, or even XRT.
Okay, so um, this is a picture of the <laughs> variable sky um, as viewed by the southern hemisphere, at least. And you notice the big hole up in the top left there. And each one of these points looks a lot like that light curve in the top left, which is basically time on the x-axis and brightness on the y-axis. And the question, again, is, you know, is this object, which looks kind of nasty and looks sort of random, worth spending time on from a follow-up perspective? Um, and uh, there was a survey that was published uh, a number of years ago that had 50,000 variable stars of the sky, and there were only about 800 of those that had bona fide classifications across about 25, 26 different classes of variable stars. And we asked the question, could we use that um, uh, data to basically get uh, a good classifications that were probabilistically um, uh, determined from that, uh, from that survey? So we did, you know, what we uh, sort of generally will do when we do a machine learning approach is the old school thing. We um, make this into a supervised problem. Um, we take that very ratty time series data, turn it into a supervised classification problem where we just do features. And so uh, we produced about 75 features from that using unordered statistics like variability metrics, um, st ordered statistics and doing periodograms, et cetera. Um, and then even context metrics, so where is this on the sky, what color is it, et cetera. Um, and with that, we were able to produce um, what is uh, and, and was the um, sort of uh, uh, best in class um, where we wound up being able to very reliably and with calibrated probabilities determine over these um, many classes uh, what a source was. So if you gave us a source that wasn't part of our training data um, and uh, uh, you asked us to label it, we were able to show um, what its class was and then we were able to do some follow-up observations of that source um, to actually prove for a minority subset of those that the classifications um, were, actually, uh, were actually correct. And we produced um, what I think is one of the first probabilistic catalogs of variable stars um, which we made accessible to the, to the world where um, we sort of let people traverse through uh, the, the, the sort of taxonomy of variable stars, um, click on things, and then um, order them by the different probabilities of whether they belong to that class or not. So you can see sort of that blue curve there is the probability. And then on the right-hand side, you wind up seeing um, essentially the probability that these belong to different classes. So um, having probabilistic, oh, then we made it social so Facebook would buy us. That didn't work either. <laughs> um, and so you know, what we're able to do is basically produce these, uh, this catalog. Um, and what we've done since then is uh, work on a system uh, which we call Cesium, um, which allows not just us but many other people to basically build their own um, uh, survey classifiers over large amounts of time series data. And we did this uh, you know, around astronomy, but we try to make this in a domain agnostic way so that you could actually use this on any sort of domain that had um, time series data. Um, so this is still a work in progress, but we're now actually starting to be able to use this for new surveys um, as they come online. And rather than building sort of one-off purpose-built um, infrastructure, we're getting to build a whole bunch and, and make use of a whole bunch of, uh, of um, subsystems in these architectures um, that you know, kind of use some of the uh, modern software practices. Now again, one of the things I want to emphasize is that building probabilistic catalogs and making websites and stuff is cool, um, but our main focus of doing this is to be able to do novel science. And so what we try to do in my uh, group was take that probabilistic catalog and then ask interesting questions of that um, and then do uh, follow-up. So, for instance, um, what we're able to do is uh, look for very strange types of objects called Arcor Bohr or DY per stars. Um, and uh, cutting to the chase, with uh, follow-up observations with spectra of only about 20 of our candidates, um, eight of them wound up being new uh, discoveries of these very, very rare stars in a catalog that had been around for 10 years. And one of the stars was almost as bright as you could see with the naked eye, and it was probably known by the Babylonians. Um, and here we were able to do this using uh, machine learning to help us basically hone in on the probable objects. Um, very, very low purity of the sample, but very high efficiency of, of discovery. Yeah. Going back to, to the catalogs and the surveys, yeah. is there any, are there any sources of bias, of sort of aside from southern hemispheric bias? Uh, that's a great question, and it's something we sort of try to grapple with. 
you don't. I mean, I there is a there is a bias measure. in the sense that it, it was taken by a single telescope in a certain filter, um, and it was taken with a certain cadence. So we're certainly biased in that survey against finding objects that change very rapidly and go away. That's one bias, so you don't see any of those in the sample. Um, they spend a lot of time in the galactic plane, and there's certainly a distribution of variable star types that are different in the galactic plane than they are off the galactic plane. And we're trying to figure out how you could sort of disentangle uh, almost the prior of what you would expect that distribution over those 26 classes um, to be, so that instead you could um, wind up producing some sort of posterior um, that people could then dial in whatever their biases were and get different probabilities out. Yeah, I think uh, I saw the Magellanic clouds there too. Yeah, the Magellanic we're clouds are there, and we don't have those in the northern hemisphere, et cetera. So yes, certainly there are biases in that, which is why there is some uh, difficulty, which I'll highlight at the end, of taking that you know entire classification machinery and that model exactly, and then applying it to another survey. Another survey taken of the same part of the sky um, would discover and would have in its catalog a different distribution of, uh, of variable stars. Um, the other thing we did is find uh, uh, highly eccentric um, uh, 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 detached eclipsing binaries, um, which allowed us to put, uh, with again, follow up observations uh, with uh, high resolution spectroscopy, um, uh, uh, the stars that we found on the mass radius relation of stars, which is a pretty fundamental thing that you'd like to know. Um, this is actually hard to find stars where you can actually do this, uh, but we were able to find a number of those. And again, we use that, that catalog as a launching off point to do, um, to do novel science. So those became science papers in and of themselves. Um, and the last thing that we've done uh, in this field is something that's, I think, still pretty bizarre and I'm still coming to terms with. This is the idea of looking at a light curve like the ones I've shown you and trying to infer the fundamental properties of those objects that you would only get traditionally from spectra. So what is the temperature of that object? What's its surface gravity? Um, what, what, what's its metallicity? And what we're able to show is that by just looking at the variability in time over a couple of different um, colors of variable stars um, in a certain part of the sky, we're able to infer the three properties I just mentioned with as much accuracy as you would get from a low resolution um, spectrum. So it turns the time domain surveys like ZTF and LSST into these uh, sort of low resolution spectrographs. So the way I think about that um, is if you heard an opera singer on the other side of the door, um, you could guess their gender. That one's pretty easy. That's like temperature. You could guess their weight and you could guess their age and be accurate to about as well as you could do if you're actually able to then go and measure them directly. Um, so this is very interesting. Um, like the, the gamma ray burst project, this is only something that's worked so far in retrospect. We've yet to then apply this to new surveys, but this is one of the things that um, we're hoping to do uh, as, new, as some of these new surveys come online. Everything that I've mentioned so far has been using you know, what I'll call kind of handcrafted um, features. Um, but there are some real uh, challenges with that. Feature engineering, uh, for those that know about that, is very expensive and oftentimes requires a lot of domain knowledge. So if you are trying to separate two very similar types of classes of variable stars, oftentimes you'll bring in the expert uh, in that domain or subdomain or sub-subdomain and try to build some math that encodes what their brain is telling them of why these two things are different. Um, that's an expensive and iterative process. Um, it's also a small data problem where we don't have a lot to train on. Um, and oftentimes the traditional machine learning techniques don't account for um, feature uncertainty. Um, and it's often very difficult to apply one model to another one, uh, to another survey. So one of the things that um, I'm excited to talk about uh, today is um, where we basically threw out traditional feature engineering and we used um, an autoencoding uh, recurrent neural net um, to basically create those features for us in an unsupervised way. So that is where we don't need a whole bunch of labels. And for those that don't know about autoencoders, the idea is actually pretty simple. You um, create an encoding function, um, which is uh, demonstrated with this E here, of that light curve, essentially that raw data. 
um, and then it's actually probably pretty hard to see on the screen, um, you basically uh, uh, compress that down to a bottleneck, which is a, a small number of uh, floating point numbers, like 64 numbers. And then you um, take that encoded small number of data points and you decode it um, so that you try to reproduce your original uh, light curve. So without knowing what this object is, um, I can basically build this, uh, if I get the architecture right, I can basically build this encoder, bottleneck, decoder thing, and then use the bottleneck um, as features uh, in a traditional classifier. And the, um, this encoding process actually works uh, pretty well. These are some examples. The raw data is up at the top. Uh, for two different um, sources. And um, for now, just focus on the red curve. Uh, what you can see if we fold it on the correct period of this um, source, you wind up seeing that the red points very well match um, the blue data. So the encoding um, and the decoding, even though it's a very lossy process, winds up uh, producing some uh, pretty nice looking uh, light curves. And what's cool about that um, is something that we were able to demonstrate in the paper, where if we just had sinusoids, very noisy, irregularly sampled sinusoids, um, and we actually looked at those encoding uh, features, essentially it's like a small um, you know, m-dimensional embedding, we're able to show that those features correlate very closely with the things that we put in. Um, so we get period out, we get um, phase out, uh, we get amplitude out of these things. Um, and so what does that mean? It means that this network is learning, in this case here, uh, what it means to be a periodic um, source. And it learns what it means to have a period of a certain sort because we're taking what is you know, hundreds of data points and compressing it effectively down to four. Um, and in the context of astronomy, what we're doing there is we're not saying we know this has got to have this period and it's got to have this amplitude, it's got to have this skewness and kurtosis. It's saying just learn the features that get me back to my original source. So the cutting of the chase here, uh, we're able to show that we rivaled sort of the best in class results from all the handcrafted um, feature engineering. Uh, in two of the three um, surveys we looked at, um, we basically beat uh, all the other um, best in class uh, uh, sources uh, and models. Um, so we're very excited about this and what it means uh, for us is that we can, instead of having to build new features uh, for, every new, um, for every new survey we look at, we can actually just throw it into this machinery and use that bottleneck layer as a way for us to uh, build features. So for those um, ML folks uh, in the room and online, um, here's the uh, architecture we used. I think one of the important things to point out is that um, unlike other recurrent neural net architectures, we're able to make explicit use of the, um, of the delta times between the observations. Um, and we're also in our loss function accounting for the inherent uncertainties in the observation. So if you have one observation which is kind of ratty and doesn't have a very good measurement, actually has a very large error, it won't uh, adversely affect your, um, your reconstruction. Um, and what's also nice about this is we're able to augment our data uh, not by, as people do in the image domain, moving images around and shifting them and changing pixels here and there. We're able to take the original light curve data itself and uh, essentially bootstrap resample that light curve and that actually wound up helping the learning quite a lot. And I think the thing I'm kind of most excited about, it means that we can do unsupervised uh, feature learning. So instead of having to learn features um, and build features by hand, we can leverage you know, large corpuses of unlabeled light curves to build up these features. Um, and uh, because that bottleneck just becomes these abstract features, we can then use those and, um, and augment them with other sort of metadata like colors, et cetera. Um, I'll skip that for now. So let me just in the last um, few minutes highlight uh, some of the challenges and open questions that we, uh, that we have. Um, one of the things I'd love to spend time on with uh, the folks in the room um, is trying to understand how we can find uh, new phenomena. So look at a retrospective catalog and say, are there any clusters in some space that are different than the types of objects we already know about? Um, and I'd also like to, in a real-time mode, as a new object is just starting to develop, not just identify this is worth following up, but identify is this worth following up and it's actually different than anything we've ever seen before. 
or different enough that it's worth spending even more resources on um, uh, to, 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 to learn more. Another thing that I think is interesting is this whole small data or at least small label corpus problem. Um, and the question there is you know, how we can leverage um, you know, one uh, model built on one survey and apply it to another survey that's transfer learning. Um, can we even do better than, uh, than this sort of 4% misdetection rate? Um, and there, you know, uh, teams like uh, at, at Harvard, um, Pavlos Protopapis and his group are looking at some unsupervised and semi-supervised um, techniques. Um, what's interesting is that if you think about the architecture that we created uh, for the classification problem, this is a very non-linear, non-parametric model that can produce light curves of, of realistic light curves of real objects without me having to put the physics in. Um, so can I use this um, sort of going the other way and try to infer back the physics for some of these objects whose physics we actually know? Um, you know, can I use these as surrogates or emulators? For instance, let's say in the gravitational wave world, it's extremely expensive to generate a gravitational wave signature um, with a few input parameters um, computationally. So you have these coarse grids. Can you fill in those coarse grids with, um, with similar types of networks um, to produce these emulators? And can we use these neural net um, models to be able to help LSS, LSST, for instance, uh, figure out what their cadences should be. So if I can now produce a fake universe of transients of all different sorts, you can then um, actually create a cadence and optimize on a cadence to be able to find those uh, sources. Um, and then systematic uh, or systemic op optimization is probably uh, beyond the reach of, of this group or anyone, which is optimize over all global resources. I'd love to be able to maximize the scientific output. Um, but again, we're in this sort of competing mode where different groups are all trying to get access to uh, similar telescopes. Um, and last, you know, does this all have to be fully automated or is there still a role for people in the sort of real-time loop of the real-time discovery? Certainly people eventually will be the ones that write the papers, or at least for now. Um, and if that doesn't happen, you know, that'll be pretty exciting as well. Um, but is there a role for people to be asked questions from the model and say, I think it's one of these two. Can you do a little bit of exploratory work? Give me the answer, and then the model could wind up updating itself. Um, so I'm, I'm generally curious about that. Um, so let me end with a pretty exciting discovery that was announced just a couple of days ago, um, where uh, an astronomer in Argentina was uh, just turning his telescope on for the first time. And the first thing you do is you look at a beautiful galaxy. Um, and he happened to catch uh, a supernova that was going off right in the earliest stages. The earliest stages pretty much we've ever seen. Um, and these are the observations from that amateur astronomer. Um, and then eventually, observations were taken uh, later, as in like a day later. Um, and uh, you know, it took a while for the astronomer, the amateur astronomer, to figure out that there was this new source. Um, but you know, this was heralded as like winning the cosmic lottery. You turn on your facility, you look at something, you find something that shows up in nature. You know, a, a, a couple of years later, or a, couple, or a year later, um, and people are very excited about this, rightfully so. This is the earliest parts of the evolution of a supernova that we very, very rarely get access to. Um, but I, what I hope you've seen in the talk today is that we shouldn't want to win the lottery as astronomers, right? We want to guarantee uh, a nightly annuity of essentially guaranteed <coughs> payoff um, and have that be optimized not only over our facility um, but globally. Um, and so I think that's an important point. We're trying to systematize uh, discovery and inference, um, and it's very clear that machine learning is becoming you know, a very, very critical part of that whole process. So I'll stop there, and I think we've got time for just a few questions. So was that the G in you uh, in the last slide there? Oh, no, the, the one before about the annuity. Oh, the annuity. Yeah, well, um, guaranteed payoff is much, much nicer than, than yeah. uh, you know, every now and then, if you're lucky. So I, did, I wanted to kick off with a question for you. Um, did you learn anything interesting with the things that you misclassified? Was it um, something missing in your model, or was the actual object that you were looking at not exactly, like the label on it wasn't exactly the 
Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, the the construction of a model, or even more broadly, a, a system of software that in, that involves applying a model to data um, and building that model, uh, you often wind up holding out some of the sources that you think you know the answer to, and you apply the model to that. Um, and, and then you measure how well you think you're doing. Um, oftentimes, you're extremely confident in the model that this source is, let's say, of, of type R Lyrae or supernova, but the label says something else. Um, that's, that's either your model's wrong, which is often the case, or sometimes it's a cause to go back and say, was my label actually right? And so it actually can be a bit of an iterative process for the mislabels during this model construction process where you go and you say, did I actually label that right or not? And if you labeled it right, then your model was wrong. And the question is, what can you do in your model so that you don't get that wrong again? And uh, what you do there is potentially go back to the drawing board and say, what are the other features that I'm missing, right? Um, one of the negatives of the sort of neural net, recurrent neural net autoencoder uh, that I presented is that it becomes much more of a black box. You don't know what those features are. So do you add more features, you make less. Um, one of the benefits of the hand-coded feature is if you get something wrong, you can say, oh, I got it wrong because I forgot to take into account that some of these types of objects look like this at the beginning, even though most of the ones in my training set look like something else. So I'll just build an extra feature that fits for that sort of thing. So um, I think the, that's a long answer to your short question. Uh, it's an iterative process. You either learn something about you know, how you're doing modeling in, in effectively, or you could learn something fundamental about your data. Now, the real challenge is if you're doing all this in an offline mode, because you've iteratively sort of rebuilt your model even on sort of held out testing data, you haven't really held out your testing data as, as much as you need to to gain a, a real good confidence of what your ultimate uncertainties and errors are going to wind up being once you put this into a live mode. So what I generally say is that the only real testing data is data that hasn't been created yet, i.e. the universe hasn't evolved in the next second to produce those objects. So um, it's all very well and nice to have, you know, here's my false positive, false negative curve on paper. Uh, the only real machine learning system in astronomy that you can trust is one that's actually been put into production, is my contention. You mentioned the optimization, global optimization of follow-up. Uh, we just, as the community, just witnessed the largest follow-up campaign ever conducted for a source. Is there any evidence, in your opinion, that it was suboptimal in some form? I think um, that was a, that's a great question. So we just saw, for those that didn't hear it, uh, essentially the entire world of astronomers going after one place in the sky. It was massively suboptimal. Um, you know, people were observing the same part of the sky with the same sort of filter at the same time. Now, the nice part about that is that we're really, really sure that the observations at that point in time in that filter were right because it wasn't one person saying, it was 10 persons saying. So there is something nice about that. Um, but there was very little coordination, I'd say. Um, and the next time, there should be more. Now, what happens is because these precious follow-up resources like large telescopes are indeed precious, what you wind up seeing is that the people that lord over those, like the directors of them, wind up being a, a, a bit of a you know, playing referee and saying, well, you guys shouldn't do it, or oftentimes more of a matchmaker and saying, you're all asking me for the same observation. You are now part of the same group. Um, and so it's a very ad hoc, uh, very kind of real-time process of how these collaborations wind up evolving. It's hard to see how we break out of that model. Individual telescopes and telescope consortia are doing a pretty good job of that, recognizing they need to optimize. Uh, but globally, I think this is you know, largely intractable problem, not technologically, but more sociologically and politically. Matsu, do you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to say I really enjoyed your talk, Josh. The question I had was about your encoder. Um, yeah. You showed a slide about different variable stars. I was trying to read it quickly. Yeah. But it's up, the three examples, I think, were all periodic. So uh, yeah. not this one. I think the one after we have a table where you compare to more traditional methods to this fancier. <coughs> oh, yeah. yeah. This one. Yeah. So um, is this, uh, I mean, I, I was curious how this, how well this works for um, uh, for variable cells that are not periodic, and where even if the final answer is not 90-something percent, yeah. the, 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 the traditional classifiers really do a bad job, so they, they could be more dramatic 
improvement, uh, whether there it's is... A, it's a great question. We focused on periodic variables because there was the largest corpus of label data that we could find on those. We are asking that exact question on not just variable stars, but explosive sources. There's a new um, challenge coming out called the Plastic Challenge, which I'm sure you know about, which is for supernovae and transients, um, so particularly non-variable stars, of being able to classify those. So there's a group that's going to be producing fake versions of all these different types of objects, and they're asking the rest of the community, can you build a good classifier on that? I think the sort of network that we built can be very applicable to those, but I, we haven't done the work yet to see um, how good those are relative to the other classifiers. Because that's where you don't know a priori what the features should be, right? I mean, when you're in that's that's a, a that's right. Um, unfortunately, you know, a lot of the very aperiodic stars are ones that just have stochastic variations, and so there's other than fitting, you know, power spec power spectrum density distributions of like what the variability is, there's not a whole lot of other features that you can build. Certainly a periodogram doesn't really make sense in that context. Um, but in the context of like burbling quasars, we have built specific purpose-built features knowing that quasar light curves behave like damp random walks and so you can get parameter fits out of those. So we have one question from the Twitter universe. Twitter universe. Um, Eric Bellum of all people. A question for you, is it practical or useful to apply a fine-tuning layer atop your pre-trained auto-encoding neural net to apply it to new surveys, a la applications using ImageNet? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, that's our supposition. I think we mentioned that a bit in the paper, but we haven't done the exercise to take a pre-trained network on a large survey and just say, this network has figured out something fundamental about how variable stars work. But it's not, it doesn't know a lot about this way in which this particular data was taken in this other survey. Let's apply it. We have taken uh, the network we built on one survey, applied it directly to the other, and it worked really well. Just like when you apply ImageNet or VGGNet to images that aren't from that original corpus, you get very good answers. But you're right, what you'd like to be able to do is freeze some of the layers of the model and then retrain some of the other layers so that it learns some of the peculiarities of that, of that survey. That's a good question. What? Right. Go ahead. Almost. For, for the, well, he's had his hand up for a while. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, so my question follows up from this one um, about the um, follow-up for use of telescopes resources. Uh, that sounds an awful lot like explore versus exploit in behavioral ecology, which game theorists say quite a bit. Have you looked there for inspiration? Certainly the notion of explore exploit is top of mind you know, in the groups that I've worked in where you say I can either go after let's say type 1a supernovae which if I get enough of those it's a guaranteed payout on some time scale. Um, exploit as in I have a little moment in my telescope follow-up resources where I don't have anything scheduled. Why don't I go after something I'm not sure what the answer is? Um, what hasn't been done is where there's kind of an explicit uh, a discussion, um, identification of what the explore exploit metrics are, let alone the adherence to those metrics. Because oftentimes when you're on a telescope and somebody hands you a basket of 100 objects that you could look at, you go, eh, I don't like that one. That one's in that part of the sky. I don't like that part of the sky right now where there's a cloud over there. So um, we haven't done a really good job as a community. I don't know any <coughs> groups that are being extremely explicit about we are going to explore this amount, as in potentially waste a whole lot of resources, and exploit this amount. I maybe take the rest offline. Yeah. yeah right. okay. okay, so uh, let's take our lunch break now, and then we'll come back at 1.30. <laughs>